Metro on 101.9 WDET-FM. I'm Tia Graham. Coming up on the show today, there's a new app for artists. We'll talk about that with creators of the app and an art fair they put together to catapult the careers of Detroit creatives. But we don't all have things in common. Many Americans are upset about the same thing right now. Prices, housing prices, gas prices, and higher prices at the grocery store. All these increases are making the cost of living high right now. So high, in fact, that it's caused a majority of Americans to wrongly believe that we're in a recession. The Federal Reserve recently lowered interest rates to hopefully tame prices, But a new report by the U.S. Census Bureau just showed that Michiganders' household incomes are falling behind rising prices. To discuss why this is happening and what can be done about it, we have economist Don Grimes here. He is a senior analyst for the University of Michigan's Research Seminar in Quantitative Economics. Don Grimes, welcome to the Metro. No, thank you for having me. Of course. So let's start here. What causes inflation? What causes prices to go up by a lot? Um, Well, their uh, traditional uh, explanation for inflation is that there's too much money chasing too few goods or services. And uh, what happened uh, is that during the pandemic, the government, federal government, gave out a lot of money to people. And that at the same time, uh, production uh, really uh, declined because of uh, part shortages and, and and worker shortages. And so um, there were fewer goods and services available and more money for people to spend once once we got past the pandemic. And that helps uh, send up prices. That's a very traditional uh, explanation of, of uh, why prices go up. Yeah. And if you could just go more into dealing with inflation caused by supply chain issues that we're seeing. Dur- uh, we saw during the pandemic, but we're still seeing some of that now. What is the cause of these prices continuing to go up? Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, uh, they're going up, but at a much lower rate. Mm-hmm. And so right now, one of the things that's happening is that uh, workers are getting uh, relatively large uh, pay increases. And that's, uh, you know, uh, causing firms to uh, increase the price of, of goods and services uh, to help, you know, to, to help offset the cost of labor increase to them. So you sort of, uh, the Federal Reserve has, uh, has been really worried about uh, uh, excessive uh, pay increases, and that's one reason why they increased interest rates uh, so much, because they basically wanted to really slow the economy and, and slow the demand for labor so that uh, workers couldn't get as big a pay increase. Um, so that's that's sort of why prices are going up. But I think uh Things are actually worse for most uh, families, most American families, than even the price and income data show. Mm. And I think that the uh, you know you, you can get a, a small decline in uh, uh, real household income in Michigan compared to 2019, um, about three uh, percent using the, the American Community Survey data. But I think most people are actually uh, suffering an even bigger decline. And so maybe we should just talk about that for a second. Yeah, definitely. Continue on. I would love for you to just kind of explain that a little bit more for those who are listening right now. If you are just joining us, we're speaking with Don Grimes. He's a University of Michigan economist, and we're talking about high prices outpacing households in household incomes in Michigan. So, yeah, if you want to go ahead and just break that down for us a little bit more and talk about you were talking about there, household income dropped 3 percent in Michigan from 2019 to 2023. We're seeing this really, really um, 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 hitting the Midwest pretty hard, as well as parts of the East Coast. So what are you seeing? Well, I, um, everybody has to realize one thing about the price uh, measures. And what they do is they uh, try to control uh, for the quality of goods. So uh, what that means is that everybody is to, is the, uh, trying to maintain if, you're, if your real income doesn't go up, if it remains the same, that means you get to buy exactly the same goods and services that you bought say, you know, four years ago in 2019, or if you're doing a price comparison back to, say, 1990, uh, then you're buying the same stuff that you bought in 1990. And uh, that's really important because, of course, a lot of the improvements 
are uh, built into the products we buy, like televisions. You know, they, they get better every year. The consumer price index for televisions is actually declining at an annual rate of about 20% a year. Um, it's, that's not the transaction price. People still spend uh, about the same or maybe even more on televisions than, than they did in the past. But built into the consumer price index is an assumption that you're going to be spending 20 percent less a year because you're going to be buying the same televisions you did, you know, three years ago, five years ago or 20 years ago. And the same thing is true of uh, cars. Uh, You know, there's a lot more gadgets um, in cars, but uh, the consumer price index is assuming you're buying the same car you bought 10 years ago or 20 years ago. And so the transaction price of cars is going up. And, of course, that's what people really pay um, is the transaction price. So people are feeling more squeezed, uh, partly because uh, the the actual spending that they have to buy goods and services is costing them more. Um, And and that's uh, something that people miss over time. Um, so, so we are, we're sort of built in to get more and more stuff every year to have a real increase in our standard of living. And now we can't, um, because real incomes are, are, are actually declining. Yeah. So, uh, Don, the federal reserve recently decided to lower the interest rates. Uh, uh, what effect may that have on prices? Will we see some of the folks start to see relief ourselves, all of us see a little bit of relief because of this, or what are, what are the, the goals for, uh, for the federal reserve deciding to lower interest rates? Well, when they are cutting interest rates, they believe that uh, that the economy is slowing enough to uh, to get price uh, stability or at least a moderate moderate price gains. So they think we're on a path to what they call a soft landing, which means that we'll get inflation down to about two percent. And by a soft landing, they hope that they can slow the economy without actually causing a recession. Yeah. Uh, you know, when a recession is when there you get massive job losses. Um, and uh, that's been the, uh, really the traditional way uh, for the Federal Reserve to uh, engineer lower price increases um, is, uh, is to cause a recession. Uh, they don't do that intentionally. Um, they try to avoid it. And uh, it looks like this time they may be able to avoid a recession. But uh, frequently that's the result is a recession. So that's why everybody was uh, scared of higher interest rates. So, uh, but Don, there's also uh, Don really quickly, income. really quickly. So two percent is the goal for the Federal Reserve. Just wanted to clarify that for those who are listening right now. That's the goal that they aim to to hit each year. So you know that's something that they're going to be pushing to do. Uh, hopefully to scave off and, and scare off or push away a recession. So uh, if we can just continue on here, how are high prices changing our politics right now? What do high prices do to our voting patterns? What are you seeing, especially as you look through the data, you look through the information? But, um, you know, clearly uh, people are used to getting an an increase in their uh, standard of living, real incomes. They expect going up about 2 percent a year. And, of course, uh, you know, we've had four years where we're we're, declining or or flat income growth, uh, really declining. And so people are not very happy with their economic uh, situation. And uh, a big part of that, again, is is increased prices. But the effective increase in the prices is much higher than what people are are paying because of the uh, uh, increased quality that the uh, BLS takes out of the price index. So what people are actually paying is 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 putting even more pressure on them financially than than the price index measure uh, shows. The other aspect of that is, is is the fact that you have higher interest rates. Uh, which really put the squeeze on people who own debt Mm. because they're actually that does not get built into the consumer price index. But, of course, it reduces the money that people have to spend if they have to pay higher interest rates on their credit card debt that they've run up uh, trying to, you know, trying to keep their real standard of living uh, the same or increasing. Um, So they um, you've got you've got a double whammy there where people are having to have to pay more and more interest payments. Mm. So I think there's a lot of dissatisfaction with the economy. And I think a lot of it is really legitimate in terms of uh, American consumers. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, any um, uh, president or any politician in general is going to be able to do much about it. But uh, people are not very happy and, and they tend to blame the incumbent party. 
You know, I find it so interesting, Don, because you just hit on the last question I was going to ask. you: Is there anything local and state politicians can do to help incomes um, outpace prices here in the state of Michigan? And you kind of already leaned into that one. Uh, not much. I mean, it's, uh, you know, that we're sort of entering an era uh, where I think people are going to have to realize that they are not going to be able to get uh, growing incomes uh, every year. And uh, we may need to scale back our our expectations for uh, uh, continually increased uh, standard of living, or at least um, hopefully we'll get continue to get some sort of an increase in our standard of living, but probably not growing as fast as it has in the past. Um, and I'm not certain that there's anything uh, that that anyone can do about that. Um, uh, it's just, a, you know, we've, we're, we're at full employment. We're not going to get any more much more income in most households be, by putting, you know, more, more people in the family back to work. Um, we have a lot of debt that's out there, both in terms of government debt and also personal debt, and people are going to have to finance that. Interest rates are going to come down, uh, but they're not going to come back down to, you know, 0%, 2%, 3%. So people are going to have to get used to paying more uh, to finance their their debt, and, and the government's going to eventually – have to increase taxes. Everybody's talking about tax cuts when they're politicians, but the federal government's running a budget deficit equal to seven percent of GDP, um, and it you know the, the it's likely to increase. So um, as a share of GDP, and at some point that'll become unsustainable. So they'll have to increase taxes. Um, I uh, you know that I, I also fear that uh, state and local governments are going to be getting to running budget issues. Uh, so they may need to uh, increase taxes or hey, Don, scale back. One more question here just to add on to that. Can't we produce more government jobs or raise the minimum wage? Is there, are there other things that can actually happen? I know this is something that politicians often guarantee, you know, uh, the, the increase in, 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 in um, um, wages and other things like that. So why is there other ways around what we're seeing right now? So the only way to raise uh, real income over the long run is uh, once you've got everybody employed, is to increase productivity. So we have to increase uh, productivity. And as a few people have reminded me, uh, the one possibility on the horizon that might really raise our productivity is uh, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So if artificial intelligence can uh, get the economy to to produce, you know, many more goods without uh, more labor input, um, then, then we may be able to get richer. So um, uh, artificial intelligence may come to the rescue, but it may take a few years to get there. Don Grimes is an economist with the University of Michigan. Don, thank you so much for taking time out of your day, joining us on the Metro and explaining to us what is going on with inflation and how it's related to us right now. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. This is the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. Today, partly sunny conditions with a high around 76 degrees. Tomorrow, Friday, mostly cloudy, 75 degrees. We could see really windy conditions up to 25 miles per hour. And this weekend, Saturday and Sunday, a chance of rain showers both days, mostly cloudy highs around 62 degrees. Coming up, we'll discuss a jazz concert happening soon at Detroit's Fox Theater. You all stay right there. This is the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. I'm Tia Graham. And you just heard a little bit of Alexander Zonchik, if you know, you know, a Detroit jazz uh, legend. He's around here. He's traveling through the city of Detroit, playing concerts all the time. And it's one of my favorite things about being from the city of Detroit. You can hear jazz almost anywhere. 
One thing we do know for a fact about Detroit is it's a way of life for many people here. It's a community that breathes, lives, and thrives. And coming up early next month is an ode to Detroit's smooth jazz love with a collection of musicians coming together at the Fox Theater for Smooth Jazz Fall Fest. Joining us live in studio to talk more about the concert is Sam Donald. Donald is the founder of Detroit Musics, a local nonprofit aimed at connecting Detroit musicians as well. We have Daryl Anderson here. He co-owns and operates Anderson. Excuse me, we do not have Derek here. Daryl is not here. We have Derek Denham here, who is the co-founder of well, let's get down to this of a and d entertainment anderson and denim entertainment thank you all so much for being here sorry about that Derek. hey look i've been called worse so oh, thank okay. you okay. <laughs> and i'll probably call them worse before <laughs> we're finished all right, right. right. Yeah. thanks for having us we yes, appreciate it of course yes yeah, so we're gonna start with you Derek. talk about the smooth jazz fall fest you know growing up for me smooth jazz v98.7 i listened to that cruising with my aunt and my father right. so just talk about bringing the smooth jazz love in this way back well, first of all, let me introduce the lineup. Yes. Uh, we have, I mean, a phenomenal lineup of artists. We've got the incomparable Nige. I think everybody's familiar with mm-hmm. Nige around the world and the country. We also have uh, a group called Jazz Funk Soul, which comprises of Mr. Jeff Lober, yes. uh, Everett Harp Jr., and Paul Jackson Jr. Uh, then we also have the Miss Kiko Matsui. She's a phenomenal pianist in I mean, we can't be more excited. And let's not forget Mr. Alexander Zanjic as well. So we appreciate them being part of what we're doing. This is going to be an annual event. This is the first year. And uh, we've got some exciting things we're doing. And we're also partnering with my good friend, Mr. Sam Donald from Detroit Music. He's a nice guy. And Sam can discuss that. And that's music with an X, sir. Yes, Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So, Sam, of course, Detroit Music, you you all do so much with connecting musicians from different genres as well as their own genre, within their own genre. So, with this particular event that we're talking about right now, your connection with the Smooth Jazz Fall Festival happening at the Fox Theater next week, you have a re- award um, a ceremony to go along with it. So, you're going to be honoring two folks. Mm-hmm. Now, I have music from the first folk, uh-huh. from the first uh, gentleman. Here we are. Let's hear it. Ralph Armstrong, Cruising in the D. Uh, This is off of his album, a 2015 album, Detroit Rising. Absolutely fell in love with the song as soon as I heard it. But you're going to be honoring Ralph as well as you're going to be honoring Baker's Keyboard Lounge. And why did you choose these two particular institutions or people and institution? Well, we're listening to this song right now and it, it, it explains it all. It's Ralph Armstrong. Detroit has two great exports. One are cars. And the other are musicians. And Ralph Armstrong is so worthy and so deserving of being honored. And Ralph Armstrong's history goes, I mean, come on. We're talking Miles Davis. We're talking Aretha. We're talking Motown. We're talking dramatics. We're talking Carlos Santana. So who better than Ralph Armstrong to be a recipient of the Detroit Music's Heritage Award? As well, we have Baker's, which for those who know, Baker's has a very long-standing tradition here in the city of Mm -hmm. Detroit, just collecting jazz musicians over the years. I mean, it's absolutely an amazing space, and it's still thriving. It's still uh, black-owned, and it's still running. So go into Baker's. Oh, you go into Baker's, and what you're going to do is you're going to go into the absolute most wonderful time capsule of jazz because Baker's in his 90th year, almost 100 years old. Yeah almost 100 years old. And to that, it's the world's oldest, and oldest meaning the, 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 the greatest, and old not meaning bad, but just old meaning something Great. to be honored. Yes. Right. Greatly honored. Yes. Let's put it together. Yes. And so no better place to honor than, than the mecca of the world's oldest jazz club, Baker's Keyboard Lounge. So that's why. It's just amazing to think a lot of the times when we think about jazz music, we often don't connect it to Detroit in an authentic way, in a, in a whole, you know, just in a holistic way, like it was born and bred here in a certain way. Right. So if we could, uh, we're going to talk to you, Derek, um, just talk about bringing this whole thing together, bringing all the folks together and, and 
in crafting it and curating the show to be for those who do truly love jazz. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> excuse me. And are passionate about jazz. Jazz will choke you up. That's the, sentimenta- <laughs> the sentimentality <laughs> and just to the history. It'll really get you. It'll yeah. get right up in there. Yeah. So that was a bass note that choked you <laughs> yeah. up right now. Coming straight from Ralph. Straight from Ralph. Right yeah, from Ralph. all right. <laughs> well, along with my partners and myself, uh, which includes HD Promotions and DA Distribution, uh, we want to do something annually. Again, we are, were talking to Alex uh, Alexander Zanjic, and uh, he was like, hey, you know, with Detroit's uh, vast wealth of jazz musicians in the past who have contributed greatly to the genre, and then to connect with uh, Mr. Sam Donald with Detroit Music. I mean, it was just a natural fit for us. Mm-hmm. Everybody in Detroit loves Nige. Yes. You know, every time he comes, whether it's at uh, Shane Park or the Aretha, shall I say, it's, it's, it's sold out. So we want to have a great show. We also, we believe in giving back as well. Mm-hmm. So it's not just about entertaining, but if with Sam's organization and what he brings to the table with the uh, young folks, that's honestly, for me, that's really a big part of it. So we're, we're excited. And again, with my man Sam over here looking at me, you know, like, what you going to say next? No, I'm touched. Yeah, but no, I, he, he really... does a phenomenal job. So the concert is just one part of it. Yeah. But to bring those kids in, to be able to touch Nige and talk to him, meet uh, Mr. Ralph Armstrong, mm-hmm. meet maybe the owners from uh, Baker's, that's phenomenal. And they're going to meet you guys because to the Detroit, to DPS schools and to their career pathway, right. are offering <clears throat> as a nonprofit organization that is interested in really espousing and turning kids on to career pathway, music and entertainment. Yes. They're going to, we're going to have 25 kids out from about four different high schools. Mm-hmm. I can name them, but if I start trouble, it'll remain <laughs> trouble. So we're going to get 25 kids out there, and we're going to have them, and they're going to, in a career pathway, opportunity to get to shadow and to meet and greet with not just the artists, that's the that's the icing on the cake, right. but also they're going to, to a potential career pathway, they're going to meet with the promotion team, mm-hmm. they're going to meet with the production team, the engineers, the logistics, all of that, and then they're also going to have food we're going to feed them (laughs) and then all of that's going to culminate with um, the opportunity to just take it all in and see where their future could be headed to match their talent and big I just want to get a shout out to our production manager who's letting us do this here uh, Jamel with uh, Sean Atkins group Mm -hmm. he's our production manager he's going to help the kids he's going to talk to them as well so we definitely want to give him his uh, props for that if you are just joining us on the Metro, we're joined by Sam Donald, the founder of Detroit Musics. And also here with us is Derek Denham. He owns and operates Anderson and Denham Entertainment. They are promoting the Smooth Jazz Fall Fest happening uh, next week. And we're discussing that concert. Um, so just kind of building on that a little bit more, because, Sam, I know with the Detroit Musics, that's one of the things that you really, really aim at is making sure you're, 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 you're connecting with the young folk. You're, you're listening to them. You're getting feedback from them and building these things around what they want and what they need. So if you can, just go into the importance of connecting with young people and especially teaching them how to navigate a career as a musician. It keeps you younger, first of all. No matter how old or older you are, it keeps you younger when you keep them in the mix. And in developing programming, the most important thing has always been my memory of this. There's nothing like cooking something, a parent, an older person cooking something for someone a younger person, and they don't like what you cooked. Mm. So it's always a matter of finding out where they are, what they like, and what they want to digest. So that's the key part of what we do. We always want to survey and see where the kids are, what they're listening to, and then because our goal is to introduce and reintroduce everybody to Michigan's music heritage, then we find out how how to fill the gaps, shoot the gaps, and then engage them properly. And to the now that DPS is re-engaging mm-hmm. um, and reinserting music programs to a lot of these wonderful um, music people in, in different roles, you have them in in their in your traditional band leaders and all of that in those areas. But then you just have some other wonderful musicians who are doing some wonderful things. Like there's a guy named Rayman over at Northwestern High School, mm-hmm. one of the best drummers Drummer. you're gonna find in the world. <laughs> mm-hmm. Charlie Wilson pulls him. A lot of guys. He was at the White House nice. band, but to all of that. 
he's one of the plugs that's able to connect us to the young people. And there are a lot of plugs here in the city of Detroit. And so, and you're one of them as well. Oh, and so, uh-huh. and so to <laughs> all <important>. of that. <laughs> so that's the big thing. So the older village, you're not older, you're, but to the older village, we're connecting them with the young and we're having a ball doing so. And this is one of those great opportunities that we're able to, um, to enact. And so this is where we are. So we got about two or three more questions before I let both of you go. But mm-hmm. Derek, um, you know, just working in production, putting the whole thing together, connecting with the musicians and, 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 and working with with Sam mm-hmm. and your partner as well. Sure. Why do you think Detroit always turns out for jazz? What, what What is that spark? What is it about jazz in, you know, in, in particular that makes Detroiters just come out? It started here. Mm-hmm. It's simple. It started here. Yeah. And one thing about Detroit, we're going to show out. <laughs> whether it's in Detroit, whether it's in Houston, whether it's with Detroit Lions, we're going to show out. And, uh, again, I, I can't commend Sam uh, much more. I, he just, he's phenomenal what he does. Uh, I don't know all the history of the jazz in Detroit. So to history, we know it started in New Orleans. I'm doing that teaching <laughs> thing. And as always, again, with our great export of musicians, we know that we have been able to be sought after Greatly. Miles Davis. Right. Again, Caddy Baker's key came to visit. Just another Caddy Baker's keyboard lounge. Came over there to play. Recognized guys like Ralph Armstrong. Correct. Mm-hmm. Recognizes other great bass players like Michael Henderson. Again, it's always been said that if you want to start a great, a great band, you need two things. That would be two musicians from the city of Detroit. There you so go. To the addition that we provide to jazz, that's exactly squarely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's what we created. Yeah. We created the pipeline. Put twist on we it created too. the pipeline. Right. I like it. We created the pipeline of jazz musicians. There you go. I like that. And you're welcome, world. Yes. And you're I don't, welcome. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't want to forget. We have another artist. She just been. She's just been added to the show with Nige, Miss, and she's a Detroiter, Miss Beth Griffin Manley, the vocalist, the vocalist, and she plays with uh, Kim. She's played with Anita, and unfortunately, her mom just passed. So, oh, so I want to just give a you know, shout out to her, and we're praying for her and her family as well. Exactly. Thank you so much for bringing that to the, to the show. Yes. And before we let you go, just give us that one big send off about the concert, sure. the importance of it, and if tickets, where, where we can get some tickets. Well, first of all, yes, please come out and support next Saturday, October 5th, starting at 7 o'clock. Doors open at 6. You can purchase your tickets online at Ticketmaster.com, or you can go down to the Little Caesars box office and you can purchase your tickets there. And we look forward to seeing everyone. You're going to have a great time, great calls with Mr. Sam Donald with Detroit Music, and uh, we're just looking forward to seeing everyone. Sam Donald is the founder of Detroit Musics, and Derek Denham owns and operates Anderson and Denham Entertainment. Thank you both for joining us on the Metro, and I will see you both there. Yes, you Thanks will. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. She's going to be on stage with us, by the way. This is the after talk while the music is playing. She's going to be, <laughs> while we're presenting our two honorees, Sure. Uh, she's going to be one of the people that Tia Graham is going to be on there with us. Welcome. It's the Metro on 1019 WDETFM. Coming up, we'll talk about a new app that helps connect local artists to each other and a variety of resources to help them thrive. Stay right there. Metro on 1019 WDET FM. I'm Tia Graham. Detroit is so full of artists, but many of them are not well known. Art Club is a new app that works to connect artists and collectors. And as part of their work, the app is throwing an in person event called Art Fair at five locations around Detroit starting tomorrow. The event will include about 200 artists selling their material. Joining the show now to talk about the Art Club app and Art Fair is Dorota and Steve Coy. Welcome to the Metro. 
Thank Thanks. you so much. Thanks for having us. We're super excited. I'm super excited to have you both here as well, because once again, I would love to become an art collector, but I would also love to learn a little bit more about those who are locally here. So, Dorota, what is the Art Club app and why did you start it? So, Steve and I were both artists. Um, we've been cool. in Detroit for the last 15 years creating art. And about two years ago, we just had this realization that there's just not enough opportunities for artists to be able to get their work out there. And as we looked into this, um, it was an isolated uh, feeling. There are many thousands of artists just in Detroit that don't have enough opportunities. So we started thinking about the idea, how can we use tech to bridge the gap and expand opportunities for artists? Um, And we kind of came up that an app should be something that we design and something that will help artists, um, you know, connect to collectors outside of galleries. Yeah, that's this is yes. So Steve, for the artists, what makes the app unique? What kinds of experience can they have using it? Are they just uploading and throwing their their art up there and it's, you know, hoping for the best or what how does it work? Yeah, so what I just want to um jump in and say too that we um we find that a bunch of artists are undervalued in society in general. Mm-hmm. Um underappreciated and the the galleries are amazing. They they help support it, but we mm-hmm. want we want to fill in it. We want to fill in the gaps. Because there's actually like we're finding that there's many more artists than the galleries can can even serve, mm. and so one of the things we want to do with with the app is we have a scanning feature. So, uh, you know, when you're in person, you could make a purchase. You can scan the work, or um, you know, if you just want to browse online, you can make a purchase that way. And then we want to we want to um, you know these are roadmap features, but we want to be able to connect collectors to go into artist studios. We want to be able to support galleries as a POS system. So we'll we'll work in a, in a variety of ways. We want to be able to, uh, you know, gather a, a ton of collectors from a bunch of different ecosystems and connect those ecosystems and allow for galleries to be able to promote their events. Um, so in, in a way, we're thinking about, like, we see the art world is kind of fractured a bit, and, and we think hopefully that this app can can kind of glue all these pieces together and get everyone in one pay, place and, yeah. you know, b- build communities around that. Mm-hmm. Nice little mosaic of artists yes. coming yeah. together. I love it. Yeah. So to both of you, um, just thinking about what you were talking about, thinking about getting artists in, in front of collectors and, and, and getting just more movement going, more like a cycle going with the artist and, and getting them in front of different eyes. So the app is still in its early stages. What can you do on the app now and what will it be able to do in the future? And, and, and when we talk about the future, of course, and bringing these different technologies together, mm-hmm. where do you see something like this going and how, how big do you see it becoming? Steve? Me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I looked over and Dorota was pointing at me. Uh, we, so currently, um, it's in its beta mode. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're very proud that uh, you know, people are able to scan the work and make a purchase and, and uh, artists are able to upload the work. And we currently support collector profiles. Uh, in the future, we would love to have features, like I said, that um, you know allow people to schedule either virtual or in-person meetings with artists, um, support col- um, gallery profiles, support secondary sales to the collectors, as Dorota just mentioned. Um, so a collector has a profile. They purchase a work. They want to sell it because they're moving to a smaller home. Um, they're, they're able to just sell the work right there, and we support royalties to the artist. So, and we, we want this to, to, um, to uh, support as many artists as possible. So we want it to go as big as it, as it, can, it, can, yeah. as, as it could get. I'll yeah. expand on the royalties a little bit. So uh, artists are like the only creatives that don't receive royalties on the resale of their work. So we're really passionate about uh, figuring that out, how artists, whenever their work gets resold, receive uh, a part of the resale value. Yes, which which is great. I would love to kind of just expand on that just a little bit. We're about two, three minutes out of here. But, you know, just talking about that, I often see reprints and I'll say, well, that's a person's you know, original work, but now it's being reprinted for like 10 bucks or whatever it may be. So if we can't just go into that and how this app will help relieve or resolve some of those issues that we're seeing right now with this artist not getting the credit, the funding, the funds, the money that they deserve. Yeah, so the app supports original work. Um, We also support original prints. Okay. um, But we do not support 
other people selling other artists' work, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Steve, do you have anything to add to that as well? Just, to, just you know, building on it? Yeah, we're going to, um, like, on the without getting too technical, yeah. we're going to uh, uh, work on our image recognition software. Um, so it'll be at a point where it could actually potentially detect a fake or a reprint versus an original one that an artist has done. Mm-hmm. So that's that's a bit a bit down the roadmap, but um, there will be you know something that authenticates the work, so that way collectors are protected. They can know that they're buying the original work and not a reprint, and then the royalties can go properly. And I, I also think there's a ton of potential. You know, we're going to work with with as many artists as we can, and artists work in so many different ways. So we'll find ways to support artists who maybe want to license their images out mm-hmm. to other people to to, to be reprinted, yeah. and so. Uh, yeah, I think we're completely open. I, I mean, this is just fascinating because on the Metro, we often talk about artists and in and, and community and the art community. And if you are just joining us, we're speaking with Dorota and Steve Coy, the founders of the Art Club app and organizers of Art Fair, bringing together about 200 artists to sell their work in Detroit this weekend. So that's my transition before I let you go is the Art Fair, actually. So the app, of course, is happening, but you have the Art Fair. 200 artists are going to be represented. Can you talk about that? Yeah, we're super excited about this. Um, Starts tomorrow at noon, five locations across the city. Uh, You can go on our website and check out all the locations and the address. Addresses are provided with where the artists are. We're also, we have so many amazing installations, performances um, as part of the art fair. So make sure you check out our schedule. Um, It's it's all day event Friday, all day event Saturday, all day event Sunday. So, 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 so cool. Yeah. And if you could just go into the activations, what are some of the other things that people are going to experience other than community and a love of art? Yeah, so we have a couple of uh, special activations. Um, at the New Lab location, um, we are actually artists as well, so we've installed um, like a large elephant. And then there's also a couple of artists that are um, that have created amazing installations. Taylor Childs yeah. is one of them. Um, Michael Candy, he's working at uh, New Lab, um, New Lab Residency right now. He built a chair uh, as part of his performance that he's going to do there. Amy Fisher recreated her party store from 2017, a life-size party store that's super amazing. And I just to name I'm, a few, you know. And like <laughs> I said, the Metro and WD, we all love talking about art, talking with artists. And this is a really cool uh, app that's coming as well as an art fair coming this weekend. So definitely looking forward to it. Please keep us up to date with the app and let us know how it's going. We have been chatting with Dorota and Steve Coy. Thank you both so much for joining us on the Metro. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Metro on 1019 WDET FM. The Red Wings opened the NHL preseason by beating the Chicago Blackhawks 4 to 2, as well a lot of good news. The Tigers beat the Tampa Bay Rays 7 to 1 at Comerica Park. Parker Meadows had 3 hits for Detroit, which moved closer to clinching a playoff spot. They lead the Twins by 2 games in the American League wild card race. There are 4 games left in the regular season. I am so excited. My arms are tingling. I hope that we do get to see the Tigers in the playoffs because let me tell you something that's a Cinderella story that I'm here for. However, coming up, there's a show at the Charles H. Wright Museum being performed by a world-renowned actor. We'll chat with him about that performance as well as his work with director Spike Lee and his love of history. Stay right there. On 1019 WDET FM, I'm Tia Graham. For the first time, the Charles H. Wright Museum is hosting a series of carefully curated lectures by both nationally recognized and local performers. 
The series titled The Right Performances will kick off tonight with a set of performances from internationally acclaimed actor, writer, and director Roger Gunvair Smith. Smith is known best for his roles in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing, Malcolm X, and Ridley Ridley Scott's American Gangster. Smith will begin the series with the first of three solo performances. Tonight's show is titled Frederick Douglass Now. Joining us now is the man himself, Roger Genver Smith. Welcome to the Metro. Thank you for having me. Wonderful to be in Detroit. Congratulations to the Tigers. Uh, seven-one victors last night. Yes, super excited about that. Over the race. Yes, super excited about that. But no, thank you for joining excited us. Excited about that. Oh wow, it is so wonderful to be here at the Charles Wright Museum, doing the right thing, <laughs> right here in the D. Um, I'll be doing three solo performances starting tonight through Saturday night. Tonight, Frederick Douglass Now, tomorrow, Otto Frank, and concluding the triple play will be Saturday night with In Honor of Jean-Michel Basquiat. So go to theright.org for tickets. And Mr. Smith... I going through and just reading up on, you know, just reading up on all of the things that you've been able to do, your award winning actor, director, producer. Why the love for history? Where did the love for history come from? Because you have so many powerful historical pieces that you've written, if you've directed, if you've acted in. So why history? Well, uh, my mom had a small family library in our home, which included books such as The World's Great Men of Color, edited by J.A. Rogers, and a narrative of the life of an American slave written by himself, uh, Frederick Douglass's narrative from 1845. The Encyclopedia Britannica, which I was uh, obsessed with and kind of read endlessly from A to Z, those were the things that I was very uh, privileged to have been exposed to as a as a child. And um, somewhere along the way, it sparked my uh, imagination, not just uh, historically, but also theatrically. Eventually, I was looking for a project as an undergraduate to combine my interests and so I started doing this thing called An Evening with Frederick Douglass which was really a long evening. Even my mother told me I needed to cut to edit and I'm continuing to edit now um, here in the year 2024 making it work tonight at 7.30 hopefully at the Charles Wright Museum doing the right thing here. So, yeah. So um, why is it important for you to portray these giant historical figures, uh, I mean, especially to put them in a, in a new light for those who may not know them or who may need to have a better understanding or a different understanding of who they were? Especially well, it's, interesting that, it's interesting that we're exposed to history, but I think it's important that the history resonate in our present moment. We're in a very extraordinary political moment uh, uh, in this country. And I think that Douglas certainly has a lot to say uh, about this particular moment. He spoke in 1861 when Fort Sumter was fired upon by Confederate troops. Um, And he saw it as an immediate opportunity for the country to liberate uh, the one-seventh of the inhabitants of the country who were uh, enslaved at that point. He saw the Civil War as an abolition war. And I think that he would see this particular moment as a continuation of that war in which people are fighting for freedom and people are fighting for a certain kind of slavery. For the first time, January 6th, we had uh, the Confederate flag waving in our U.S. Capitol building, a U.S. Capitol building which, by the way, was constructed by slave labor. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so the moment uh, of Fort Sumter is still upon us, and it's good, I think, that we're able to listen to uh, Frederick Douglass to learn about his struggle, to learn about the struggle of the brilliant Harriet Tubman, who was a Civil War hero and, of course, led so many people uh, to freedom. So if you're just tuning into the Metro, we're chatting with internationally acclaimed actor, writer, and director Roger Ginver Smith. We're learning more about a new series called The Right Performances at the Right Museum. Roger is leading that off. So just a little bit about yourself. Um, you've done numerous movies with Spike Lee. You've, you both have had a love for one another. You have love for one another because you continue to go back to one another and work with each other. So can you talk about the shared interests between you and director Spike Lee when you guys found that you had these interests and how you just continued that relationship to today? Well, I was doing uh, repertory theater in Minneapolis at the Guthrie Theater. And... Um, you know, I was really happy to be doing repertory theater. I never really thought that I would have a career in film. But then one day I had an afternoon off and I went to see this film called She's Gotta Have It. And I sat through it twice and I said, who is this guy, Spike Lee? I got to find out what he's doing next. And so I was able to finagle what's called a cattle call audition Mm -hmm. for his next film, which was School Days. Cattle call means you just stand in line with a hundred other people and, you know, you've got to do a scene from the, from the script and you've got to sing a song and tell a joke. That's what that Spike had us doing. And he thought that I was demented enough to play a fraternity pledge Yoda in uh, school days. Uh, G5! <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we've been working together ever since. Yes. The brother is... Uh, Dynamic. Yes. He's prolific. Before I he let has you go. A whole generation of people with him, not just in front of the camera, but behind the camera as well. And we do see a culturally, politically eye to eye, even though he's considerably shorter than I am. <laughs> oh, if he's listening, he's not, he's going to laugh at that one. Uh, he might actually come at you for that one. But before I let you go, this is my last you'd thing have, I got You'd about. have to use a step ladder if he come at me. <laughs> Listen, I'm not laughing. You know what? I'm not laughing, Spike. If you're out, I'm not laughing. However, <laughs> so before I let you go, we got about 30 seconds or so to go. I just wanted to talk about, you know, this weekend, the series. But just tonight, you're yes. going to have an artist talk with Detroit poet laureate Jessica Care Moore. If you can just get into that for audiences who are listening, going oh, to the show tonight. The, what are we going to get into that? Yes. I don't call her laureate. I call her high rate. <laughs> um, she, she's dynamic. Um, We've worked together before. She actually um, opened for me in Central Park when I did a Huey P. Newton story. And uh, and tonight um, I'm going to open for her because she's going to bring it definitely in the D style. I'm from Detroit. (laughs) Better watch your back. I'm from Detroit where the ladies mat. That is such, that's Jessica Care Moore all day, every day, <laughs> all day, every day. We love her here at WDET, but we For really sure. do look forward to seeing the performances. Some of the producers yes. here on the show are going to be there. So thank you so much, Roger Ginver Smith, for joining the show. He's an internationally acclaimed actor, writer, and director. Smith will open the new performance series at the Charles H. Wright Museum with three solo performances. Definitely don't want to miss out on this. Tickets are on sale right now. Once again, thank you so much for being here on the Metro. Thank you. We'll see you with Douglas tonight. We'll see you Otto Frank tomorrow night, the father of Anne Frank and Jean-Michel Basquiat will do a thing in honor of that brother on Saturday night. See you at the right. Do the right thing. Have a good one. That's the Metro. For Thursday, September 26, you can listen to recent episodes online at WDET.org. Make sure to subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. It's also on YouTube. The show is produced by Sam Corey, David Lyons, and Jack Phil Branch. Our engineer is Nate Bender, and music's done by Sam Bobian and Will Sessions. This is WDET-FM, Detroit Public Radio, your connection to news, music, and conversation. Thanks for listening. Talk to you all tomorrow.